Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today in our 400th episode... All right, another milestone. This is a big milestone. I can't believe it's been 400 episodes. It's amazing. (laughs) We're like seven and a half years in at this point. And we could not have made it without all of your support. Thank you all for listening Mm -hmm. for all these years. And as a big bonus spectacular, we're going to be talking about Hatsag Island, which is that island in Romania, which is really amazing. There's tons of stuff going on there. We'll mostly talk about the dinosaurs, but there are some other really interesting animals. (laughs) Yes, especially huge pterosaurs. (laughs) Spoilers. Oh, sorry. (laughs) So most people might have heard of Hot Tag Opteryx, mm. sort of a giveaway. But to go along with that, we have an interview with Michael Benton, a famous paleontologist and an expert on Hot Tag Island. Should probably pronounce it Hot Seg, I guess is the correct way to say it. And we have our Dinosaur of the Day, which is really more of an overview of all of the animals from Hot Seg Island. And on theme, there is a fun fact about Hot Seg Island as well. Well, related to, yes. Sabrina's doing that one. <laughs> <laughs> but before we get into all of that, we want to thank some of our patrons. And this week, we'd like to thank Evelyn and Frankie, Misunderstood Overraptor, Cosmic Parasaur, Pipaceratops, Jonah, Kalosaurus Rex, Shelby, Elrex, Bruce, and James. Thank you so much for all your support. And thank you again to all of our patrons, because without you, we could not have gotten to episode 400. It still seems surreal. Yeah, that's that's a large number. So thank you again from the bottom of our hearts. And hopefully you enjoy this special episode. (laughs) So before we get into our huge overview of all of the animals on Hatsig Island, or at least a lot of them, we're going to do our interview with Michael Benton because he's the expert. So why not start there? But as always, we have an extended version of this interview for our patrons. So if you'd like to hear even more about Hot Seg Island and Michael Benton's work, then head over to your premium content feed and check it out there. And just as a taste, his work also includes the Triassic extinction events and dinosaur colors. We're joined this week by Michael Benton, who's a paleontologist and professor of vertebrate paleontology in the School of Earth Sciences at the University of Bristol. He also founded the Master of Science degree program in paleobiology at Bristol. He has written over 400 scientific papers and more than 50 books about a wide range of topics, including animals in the Triassic, extinction events, and the Hatseg Basin, or Hatseg Basin, trying to get that pronunciation right. (laughs) And he's also done quite a bit of work in the field, including in Romania. His most recent books are The Dinosaurs Rediscovered and Dinosaurs New Visions of a Lost World. Thank you very much for joining us this week. Yes, yeah, a pleasure. Thank you. So uh, since we're doing a, a special episode on the Hatseg Basin, I know you were the lead author in 2010 of this amazing paper. It's Dinosaurs in the Island Rule, the Dwarf Dinosaurs from the Hatseg Island. And you looked at, was it Magyarosaurus? Telmatosaurus, Zalmo- yeah, Salmoxes, and yeah, one or two others. That's right. And you were able to confirm that these were actually all adults, and kind of confirm yes. that whole hypothesis of the dwarf dinosaurs. Yeah, that's right. And so, if I, yeah, it, it was sort of unexpected. Of course, we think of dinosaurs as huge, but dwarf <laughs> dinosaurs. Hmm, interesting. <laughs> uh, so um, these had been noticed a lot earlier, but by working with colleagues in Germany, Martin Sander and his colleagues, we were able to look at the bone histology and try to determine the age of the dinosaurs. Uh, which had not been done before. And so that removed the criticism, if you like, of, oh, these are all juveniles. I mean, you you would say if the island is full of juveniles, that's a bit weird. But nonetheless, (laughs) you you have to sort of tick the boxes. Yeah, make sure that it's not, was that Peter Pan with the island full of lost children or something? (laughs) (laughs) I was thinking Lord of the Flies, but yeah. Oh, that too. (laughs) Were you surprised by what you found? Well, I think we were not surprised. So I can give, I, I can tell the story of this because it, it dates back over a hundred years. And first of all, people may be surprised that we're talking about a major island full of dinosaurs in Romania, in Eastern Europe. Because if you look at the current map of Europe, of course, Romania 
is largely landlocked. It's got a coast on the Black Sea. And yet we have to recall that in the Cretaceous, something like, so Hatseg Island is maybe 70 million years old, something like that. Um, sea levels were much higher. Uh, and in fact, the, the world was divided up into more continents and, and big islands than today hmm. uh, because sea levels were maybe 100, 200 meters higher. There was a big seaway right up through the middle of North America. There was another one across Africa. And much of Europe, the Mediterranean coast, Eastern Europe, was, was an archipelago of islands. And people began discovering dinosaurs on these islands uh, occurring in the south of France all the way across to Eastern Europe. And the first ones in Romania were found in 1899 by a wonderful European nobleman called Franz Nopsha whom some people may have heard of. Yeah. Uh, he, was, he was a count. He was, he was a, of a noble family. At the time, 1899, this was part of the Austrian-Hungarian Empire, so the, the political distribution in Europe was very different than the Austrian-Hungarian Empire, which obviously ended at the First World War in 1914. Nonetheless, it covered a lot of Eastern Europe. And Nopsha was in this sort of mystery land area between Austria, Hungary, Romania, and, and he spoke many languages. He claimed nationality in many countries, but primarily <laughs> Romania. And uh, he was mad about paleontology, collected dinosaur bones. Um, but he noticed early on, hold on, these are a bit smaller than they should be. You know, <laughs> these are smaller than their relatives elsewhere. And he actually speculated then. He said, yeah, maybe these are dwarfs. They're living on an island. And the analogy he had was with dwarf elephants on Mediterranean islands. So it was actually quite current at that time that um, a variety of paleontologists and naturalists had been studying elephant bones from Sicily, from, from other islands around the Mediterranean. Not very ancient. These elephants were maybe tens of thousands of years old. But they were the size of pigs. And, and people were thinking, are these babies? No, they're not. You know, they're just <laughs> teeth. People know how to age elephants. Where it's a little bit less clear how to age dinosaurs. And they were dwarfs. And so the idea was quite prevalent uh, in late Victorian times in the 1880s, 1890s. Oh, yeah. So the Mediterranean sea levels were going up and down as the ice sheets advanced and retreated. Because, of course, during the ice ages, if you lock up a lot of water in the ice sheet, sea levels go down. And so at different points, uh, uh, African animals could walk across the floor of the Mediterranean Sea. And uh, they got to these islands, and the Mediterranean would flood to some extent. And an elephant, if it's going to survive, it's better off being smaller. And there's a whole, on an island, there's a whole ecological study of island dwarfing, which is a whole, you know, a whole discipline. Mm -hmm. And so it was easy for Noxia to apply this to his dinosaur discoveries. Yeah. Yeah, that's really interesting. Was there? Did you find anything? Because we've heard little bits and pieces about Nopsha's sister. Did you find anything about that in your research? You're absolutely right. That I didn't tell the story in full. It was his sister who found the bones first of all and showed them to him. He was not an expert paleontologist, but he was looking for a role in life, I think, because although he had uh, a fancy title, count or duke or something <laughs> of the kind, and he had a castle and and traditionally would have had large estates, I've no doubt. He had no money. And how do you make money? You certainly don't make money as a paleontologist, I can tell you. <laughs> um, Even back he then. <laughs> spend, he actually sold collections of bones to the, the big museums in uh, London and Vienna. And so some of these early discoveries from Romania are actually not located in Romania anymore. Hmm. Although more recently, there's been a great deal of research by Romanian colleagues. But that's right, his sister found them. He then realized this was something important. No dinosaurs had been found in that part of the world before. But he was a smart guy. You know, he, he was doing imaginative stuff that we do now as second nature, but it was quite daring at that time, like determining are these males or females? Are they dwarfs, juveniles. He was thinking about biology, thinking about behavior, but he didn't have the kind of analytical equipment that we have today. But a lot of, a lot of what Nopsha thought was accurate. And just to roll forward in his biography, and then we can kind of park him for the, the time here. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think you've read around it. Some people have read around 
he had an interesting First World War, 1914 to 1918. He offered himself as a spy to both sides, both to the Austro-Hungarian Empire that were fighting with the Germans on the one hand, and to the British, the, the Allies, who were fighting on the other side. And I, it's, it's not entirely clear whether he succeeded in being a spy for either side, but that was a support <laughs> of income, I suppose. Um, and then after the First World War, 1918, 1919, again, he had no purpose, no money. And he carried on his paleontological studies. He spoke perfect English, apparently, perfect German, as well as, no doubt, Romanian and Hungarian, which is a real collection of languages he wrote scientific papers in German, English, and I think in French. Wow. Yeah. He was a homosexual at a time when that was not the thing to be. Mm. And he had a secretary, uh, and, and they traveled around Europe in a motorcycle combination, a motorbike with a sidecar. And sadly, in the end, I guess, having found no work, he offered himself to be king of Albania. It's another little country. <laughs> How on earth you could have the, the chutzpah to you know, offer yourself in all these different roles to so many different nations. I have <laughs> no idea. And sadly, it all ended in disaster, no money. He shot his secretary, shot himself. They committed suicide in the end. And, mm. um, but nonetheless, he left a great legacy of imaginative published work. And an amazingly interesting life. Yeah. Yeah, That's he, right. <laughs> I think he had like, didn't he have a whole side thing of anthropology in Albania or something too? It was like... Even more. He studied linguistics and origins of the different peoples of Eastern Europe, and absolutely, you know, he was a polymath. Yeah, really, he's one of those super interesting guys. That's right. Did Napsa inspire you to look into Hatzeg Island, or you were interested yes, in the dwarf yes. dinosaurs? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's right, and I think he's a big inspiration for present-day Romanians. And nothing much happened after Noxious' death around 1929, 1930, all the way through the Second War. And then, of course, Romania fell behind the Iron Curtain at the end of the Second World War. And so, again, it, it was not in great economic shape. And some will remember they had a rather terrible ruler at the end, uh, Ceausescu and his wife, and, and eventually the revolution happened in 1989, 1990. And the people rose up and threw off Ceausescu and his wife and, and killed them. There were gun battles in the center of Bucharest, the capital of Romania. And I first went to Romania in 1993, mm -hmm. uh, and it was perfectly safe by that point. It, it had become a, effectively a free country again. It's a quick turnaround. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, they showed me the bullet holes on the, the side of the geology department of the university, because Oof. Bucharest University is in the center of town. And I'd met uh, a wonderful paleontologist at a meeting in France, as it happens, Professor Dan Grigorescu, who had been, he'd been a paleontologist from the start and through the 1980s, 90s, in the difficult communist Russian-dominated times. He'd lived through the revolution and could speak authoritatively about the gun battles in the streets and, and the change of regime. And he kindly invited me to go to Romania, and we visited various locations, including Hatseg. And he has fostered a, a, a great number of young, enthusiastic paleontologists in Romania who are working on these questions now. Awesome. Is So Hatseg Island, is that in relation to modern Romania? Whereabouts is it? So it's, it's in the southwest, so it's in the most land word side it, we, we have the sea margin on the black sea on the east end and costanza which is the big resort bucharest is somewhat in the middle and then carrying on west towards the boundary with present day hungary we get to the hatseg in the south west and um yeah so it, it covers the upper cretaceous rocks cover quite a large area there's there's multiple geological formations that produce the dinosaur remains, and there's also a great deal of geological study of the area that have allowed people to try and reconstruct. Was it really an island? The answer is yes, not just suggested, <laughs> but first in 1914, the present studies suggest that. And if you look at a paleogeographic map of the whole of Europe, people have identified maybe 30 or 40 islands scattered across where the south of France, Italy, across into Eastern Europe are. 
and Hatseg is just one of those one of those islands. I think it's my favorite of those islands, though. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> quite, because a lot of the other ones have not produced dinosaur remains. So it's uh, wonderful that it has, and um, people have estimated the size of the island. And it, one measurement is seven thousand five hundred kilometers squared. There are various estimates because the sea levels change and it probably varied in size quite substantially over the course of maybe 30 or 40 million years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and so that wasn't my primary study. I was particularly interested in the dinosaurs. Yeah, that's not a very big island though. No, that's right. And I can't. I should have done my homework and I should be able to give you an analogy, but I can't. <laughs> but it's probably the size of Sicily, but that may not help people if they've not been to Sicily. But uh, yeah. Yeah, it's a decent enough size, but not big enough for huge dinosaurs to, to survive. In your paper, too, there were some other big findings, like the, the fact that these dinosaurs tended to be more basal or primitive, and then they also retained some juvenile characters. Yes. This is one of the key points that people have suggested. I guess you have to determine that you're not looking at a kind of nursery island, a kindergarten island of babies. <laughs> <laughs> so that was done by looking at the bone histology, and I'll briefly talk about the primitiveness in a second. The, the bone histology component by uh, Martin Sander and Kuhnstein was that they were able to take thin sections of the bones, and these are just standard microscope sections that any biologist would understand. You can slice through a modern bone and stick little thin slivers on a microscope slide and grind it down nice and thin. You do the same with a fossil, and it's worth reminding people that the majority of these fossil bones are beautifully preserved, and, and indeed all the detail you could hope for is visible. Nice. You know, they may be petrified in the sense that all the cavities have been filled by minerals, but actually the bone tissue is, is perfectly there. And Sandra and Kuhnstein were able to count the growth rings, and they were able to show, yeah, yeah, you know, these, these particular dinosaurs, some of them are like 10 years old, 20 years old. <laughs> they're adults, you know, they're not juveniles. So that was the first step. The primitiveness, yeah, you're right. That's another thing which seems to be true of island faunas today, often, that somehow the, they get isolated on an island, and they are not then, the, the gene pools are separated, and in this case, maybe for tens of millions of years. So whereas the relatives of these dinosaurs on land continue to evolve and they are in connection with dinosaurs around the world, because although there are lots of divisions of land masses, nonetheless, the dinosaurs could trek around quite substantially, they carry on evolving. And for some reason on the island, evolution kind of slows down. And so, yeah, people who've studied these have suggested, although these are typically late, Cretaceous, something like 70 million years ago on the island, often they're most similar to dinosaurs that lived much longer ago, 100, 120 million years ago, maybe even in the early Cretaceous in the rest of Europe or Asia, North America. So again, you, yeah, you kind of expect that sort of primitiveness as well as small size. So the dinosaurs were on island time before we were. I was just thinking, yeah, yeah the <laughs> island life. That's right. And it's not always the case, but it's, you know, when just islands, we think, you know, if you're an evolutionary biologist, you think of Darwin, you think of Galapagos Islands, you think of Darwin's finches, you may think of the, the wonderful birds on Hawaii. And so islands can, they, they can function different ways. And th these are very, very interesting discussion areas for evolutionary biologists and biogeographers and, and, you know, that kind of thing, because we understand how evolution can go fast. If you, you know, with Darwin's finches, he realized these are volcanic islands in the middle of the Pacific. They've emerged out of the water. He didn't know exactly when. We now know that they emerged maybe five million years ago, three million years ago. So all that evolution has happened really fast. And the, ar the argument there is because you've got a cluster of islands, each of the birds, the, the ancestral population is ending up scattering across the islands, and then they kind of evolve independently. Likewise, in Hawaii, as the islands pop up, there's a whole line of islands being sprouted from the seabed uh, above mm -hmm. a volcanic hotspot. And as the Pacific plates move over the hotspot, more volcanoes pop up, islands pop up, and they get populated. So there, the island is acting as a kind of it's kind of a, a nursery for species origination. 
a wee bit the same with dwarfing, but in a, in a way, evolution is sort of slowing down. So, you know, understanding how why that should be is quite a difficult thing, and I can't answer it. What are your thoughts around, because we've got the dwarf dinosaurs, but there's also that giant pterosaur <laughs> on the island yes. that was probably the apex predator, which all seems just so strange. <laughs> yes, Hatsegopteryx. And oddly enough, it was not dwarfed. And all we could say is, I think it's, so it's one of these late, uh, some people may be familiar with Quetzalcoatlus, which is a relative known from Texas. Uh, and I remember when that was found in, in the 1970s, I thought, oh, yeah, biggest pterosaur, Texas. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's what you were <laughs> But here we have a big one in, in Romania, similar size. The, these have got a wingspan of maybe 12 meters, that's about 40 feet. So this is far larger than any bird. Mm -hmm. and, uh, how, if you didn't see them, you wouldn't believe them. And some people may have seen the wonderful reconstructions of Quetzalcoatlus by the paleo artist Mark Witten, yeah. where they have it walking along, and it's as tall as a giraffe. Mm -hmm. yeah. A measure of size. Absolutely huge. And yet it probably didn't weigh much more than a human being. But <laughs> the height of the thing. And, and yeah, so that's, that's and why would it not be dwarfed? Well, it's a flyer. Maybe it was able to fly across the ocean from island to island, and maybe the populations of these pterosaurs were still in connection with mainland forms, and hence they didn't go through this kind of divergence and, and this kind of dwarfing. Yeah, that's it's crazy. Is that I know sometimes people talk about island gigantism. Is that yeah? maybe this is like a weird version of island gigantism? I wonder, yeah, maybe. I mean, you're right, because those classical, I remember seeing this in some children's book when I was young. They, they talked about these Mediterranean islands where you get dwarf elephants and giant dormice. Yeah. <laughs> and it's a weird kind of central tendency. It's a, bit, it's, it's a bit like evolution around a central tendency. And I think people have suggested that maybe on certain islands, because these terrestrial animals, not this is not talking about the birds or the pterosaurs, which can fly and get away, and it's not talking about any aquatic organism that could equally perhaps swim away and, and connect with the mainland. But the organisms that are stuck on the island, they can't get away. And there may be a kind of ideal size for a mammal to be. Mm. In other words, you can't be too huge because, of course, huge mammals like elephants or, or bison, buffalo need enormous territories to walk across because they just need big food supply and, and they have to move with the climate and so on. So you've got to get smaller. And then curiously, the other thing about islands is you have fewer species. You just have whatever happens to get there. And so maybe those giant dormice were kind of standing in for, I don't know, beavers or something else. You know? <laughs> You've got a limited number of species on the island. Therefore, they try to, or no, they don't try to, but evolution enables them to do different things. Because, of course, normally, in a normal ecosystem, it's well understood that species are packed in quite tight. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of limitation. And, and of course, in nature, organisms don't naturally compete. They tend to avoid competition. So it's well understood that there's a constraint on the range of body size or the range of diet. And people have long tested this. I think Darwin understood this, that if you take away those competitors, then the size range, the diet range of most species will increase. And so that that doesn't that's not even evolution. That's just the release of constraint. Yeah. But yeah, this sort of central tendency thing, it's a well-understood type of evolution, sometimes called the ornstein uhlenbeck model, where there's a kind of ideal body size. You know, we think about evolutionary trends where things maybe get bigger or they get smaller over time. There may be some evolutionary pressure to go one way or the other. ornstein uhlenbeck is a kind of central tendency that, that you keep. There's the selection against the extremes. And I guess on an island, the selection would be against being too big, certainly. Mm. Yeah, so you're right. There's, there's it. Islands are fantastic uh, experimental sites. Yeah, they are the best. I love even modern days, you know, we've got like Madagascar with the, the lemur population, which is unlike <laughs> anything else in the world. Yes. All sorts yes. of cool stuff. So is, you think Hatsegopteryx, do you think the idea of it being an apex predator is reasonable? Or do you think there are, because if it was the weight around of a human, then yeah. <laughs> would that really be yeah. the best strategy? 
I think I think the other interesting thing about Hatsik is, as far as we know, there were no big predatory dinosaurs. So, whereas elsewhere in the world, at the same age, you've got uh, a lot of the classic dinosaur faunas in Canada and the United States of, and, and parts of Mongolia. Similar age. This this is a bit older than Tyrannosaurus rex, but there were big Tyrannosaurids. And so in most other parts of the world, non-island parts, you have big predatory dinosaurs. But nobody has yet found such a thing on Hatseg Island. And so somehow the Tyrannosaurids and, and other big predators didn't get there. And I think we would have found them. We might not have found a complete skeleton, but you know, for two reasons. Even though carnivores are generally rarer than herbivores, just because of the nature of the food pyramid, the trophic pyramid, Obviously, each tyrannosaur needs 10 or 100 herbivores to, to, to feed it or keep it happy. <laughs> the two reasons, one is that they shed their teeth. And, and so you don't need to find a whole T-Rex skeleton. You, you can find a few isolated teeth, and they're very recognizable. And the second reason is there's a premium on finding them. You know, People are looking for them, and if they find one, they're not going to go past. <laughs> Um, and they're not there. So yeah, Hatsagopteryx, the giant pterosaur, I guess it, it was the biggest apex predator, as you say. Whether it could tackle these herbivorous dinosaurs, I've got no idea. <laughs> uh, that would be uh, another matter. They, they, whether they just fed on carrion or whether they could also feed on or hunt living forms, I've just got no idea. It's, it's a difficult one. And maybe tomorrow this will be disproved. Somebody will find a, a, a Tyrannosaurid on the island, and that'll be that. <laughs> definitely be an easier answer. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. The very least, they would have been scary to see around. Oh, yeah. Indeed. Indeed. <laughs> So we mentioned a little bit earlier, you've got you've written a lot of books. The recent ones are Dinosaurs Rediscovered, How a Scientific Revolution is Rewriting History, and then the newest one, Dinosaurs, New Visions of a Lost World. So this is a question from one of our listeners. What were the inspirations for all your books? I mean, what, how have, have you gotten your ideas for them? Yeah. So I started out like a lot of paleontologist when I was a student I needed some money so I wrote some kids books um, <laughs> that I have no I make no apology but I make no claim of originality for those either there's just a voracious appetite for kids books about dinosaurs mm -hmm. but more recently I've been interested in exploring two themes I guess mass extinction on the one hand and dinosaur well I guess it's how what do we know about dinosaurs and how do we know it and when I started out, a lot of what you would read in paleontology books and papers was perfectly reasonable, but it was, it was um, inference, or, or to use common language, guesswork. <laughs> and, you know, if somebody was to, if some expert was to talk about the topics we've been talking about tonight, could you be sure these are juveniles or adults, or what are they eating, or what color were they, or, or all sorts of stuff like that. How did they reproduce? It was all perfectly reasonable conclusions, but based on comparing with modern forms like crocodiles and birds. And so you wouldn't come up with anything too outlandish, but um, there was no way of testing. But in my lifetime, in the last 30 years of, I, I'm not 30 years old, I mean, in my lifetime of research, um, <laughs> the last 30 years, tremendous changes have happened. And, and what I wanted to represent in those two books were, was how we know what we know or how we think we know what we know. So I can just tell you two stories which make this clear, I hope, relating to Hatseg and um, dinosaurs more generally. So Dinosaurs Rediscovered is specifically about the science behind each of the themes. And I have chapters about feeding, locomotion, reproduction, bringing up babies, but also color. And, and that was the one thing when I would give lectures, I'd say, we'll never know the color. We'll never know the noises they made. Mm -hmm. Well, we do now know the color. <laughs> Understanding locomotion and feeding is a bit easier to understand because, of course, you've got the skeleton. Mm -hmm. and You can string the skeleton together. You can compare the, fun the, the nature of the joints. You can move the knee joint of a T-Rex and work out how it could move and what would be the limitations on movement. You can reconstruct the muscles because we know that T-Rex had exactly the same muscles as birds and crocodiles and indeed humans because all vertebrates have pretty much the same 
leg muscles. So you flex your biceps and your arm. You have the same gluteus maximus and various other muscles operating your hind limbs. <laughs> They're all the same. So there, there is nothing unexpected there. But what's new is we have, of course, computational methods of animating and, and making skeletons move and understanding the power of the muscle. So all of that kind of modeling can be done thanks to CT scanning of specimens and thanks to the computational iterative possibilities of modern computers. And um, color, that's the one story that I wanted to tell because we were the first in 2010 to determine the color of the feathers of, of a dinosaur. Mm -hmm. And when I mention feathers, then you realize, aha, yeah, yeah, of course. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> all dinosaurs, just feathers. But of course, it's thanks to all these amazing discoveries in China. And that's a big theme of my new book on dinosaurs, visions of a lost world. I realize it was only 25 years has seen the entire history of all these amazing discoveries from China. And the first feather dinosaur was announced in 1996. And 2021, last year, was the 25th anniversary. So all of that wow. amazing opening up of science in China has just been 25 years. That's mm -hmm. all. And they've kind of gone from nothing to whatever they are today. <laughs> <laughs> World class. <laughs> yeah. And uh, that's been so fast. And from the point of view of paleontology, this has been amazing because it was a whole closed world and then suddenly you open up a country as big as a continent really and, and all these amazing things feathers contain pigments and hair human hair mammal hair contains pigments and the story there was this is going away from Hatseg a bit but mm -hmm. uh, the color in hair and feathers is contained within capsules which are correctly called melanosomes and melanin is one of the key pigments of course giving a variety of colors there are different chemical forms of melanin. And the extraordinary thing is each of the different chemical forms of melanin is enclosed in a capsule of different shape. Mm -hmm. And so we have two approaches to determining color in fossils. One is ultrastructure. That is simply the shape of these structures under the scanning electron microscope. And the other is chemical. Because, of course, if you can distinguish chemically these different pigments, then you've got align to the actual color that's still unreliable the chemistry approach is still unreliable but people are working hard on that but the shapes we were able to determine that a particular chinese dinosaur called sinoceroptrix which if i paint a picture it's about a meter long it's a biped it's a little meat eater it was covered in a fuzz of little whiskery feathers all over the body hmm. and we noticed along the tail it's got a long thin tail for balance the fuzz of feathers seemed to be in tufts you get a tuft and then a gap and a tuft. And so we took samples, and I can tell you the curators of the museums in China were a little bit, you know, they looked a bit green around the gills when I said, you know, this priceless specimen of yours, maybe it's worth $10 million, but don't worry, I'm not going to cause a lot of damage. I just need to take my scalpel <laughs> and remove some of these feathers because we have to put them direct directly into the scanning electron microscope. <laughs> And by comparison with modern birds, we were able to determine that Sinoceroptrix was all ginger in color. No black, no gray, no brown, ginger. <laughs> and so ginger colored feathers and the, the stripiness on the tail was ginger white, ginger white. So it had a tail like an old fashioned barber's pole. <laughs> so we were able to demonstrate that. And I would argue that's scientific because up to that point, philosophers of science have struggled to justify that the historical sciences like geology, paleontology, some aspects of astronomy, that these historical sciences are really scientific because you can't repeat a laboratory experiment. The, 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 the logic would be for the color. Let me just, just outline this. It's a chain of inference. So we know that there is a constant relationship between pigment color, melanin color, and melanosome shape in living birds and in mammals. It's not just in birds, it's in mammals as well. And that means that this is a constancy across all amniotes, the, the non-amphibian tetrapods. So that's mammals, birds, and presumably anything extinct that falls it within that frame, including dinosaurs. So that's the first observation. Then you look at the fossils, you discover that the feathers or the hairs are packed full of these melanosomes. QED, you can determine the color. 
And this chain of inference could fail. You know, it can be tested all the way along. Somebody could say, no, you're wrong. There is no such relationship between pigment color and melanosome shape. The whole thing then falls apart. We fail. Mm. Or you could go to the next step and say, I'm going to sample a different fossil. And I'm going to show that what you're looking at are not melanosomes. They're bacteria or there's some other blob-like structure. I should have said the melanosomes are sausage-shaped or spherical. Mm-hmm. You know, they, it could be, oh, these are, these are bacteria. They're, they're not uh, anything to do with melanosomes. Or, you know, or, or indeed somebody could say, I've got another fossil and it contains completely different structures. And so we're in 2022. Our hypothesis has survived for 12 years without being refuted. So, but I would argue it is scientific because you can refute it at several steps along the way. So this has been a bit of a long diatribe, but getting back to the book, Dinosaurs Rediscovered, the whole point of it is to make that point quite strongly. It's quite quite a radical point that I think a lot of working paleontologists have accepted the methods and we use these new analytical computational approaches. We use new means of uh, visualizing. We benefit from CT scanning and uh, electron microscopes. We benefit from massive computational power. And actually, it's been a revolution. And, and now you don't have to believe me when I say something about dinosaurs, because I just say, oh, I'm a professor. I publish lots of papers. <laughs> you don't have to believe me at all. You can go and rattle at the evidence. And you don't disprove me, though, by just saying, I don't believe you. You, you have to then go off and, and look at the evidence, because that's what scientists do, of course. Yeah. Until we can be disproved, our hypothesis stands. So the book, yeah. And then the second book was much more fun in a way, because I, I was working with um, a wonderful paleo artist called Bob Nichols. He does digital renditions. And when he did uh, 15, we chose 15 uh, dinosaurs and relatives, pterosaurs and such like. And we looked at the primary evidence and we present that and the story of how the various research groups around the world have determined the color, uh, including some dinosaurs from North America, from the um, tar sands in Alberta, from South America, from a lot from China, of course. <laughs> and this is all very recent. This has been happening in the last 10 years. And I guess each case then Bob was able to illustrate a fantastic rendition. And we make a claim with this new book dinosaurs, new visions of a lost world, published just before Christmas last year, that each of the images is factually defensible. So Mm -hmm. each aspect of the color and the pattern we can demonstrate based on evidence. Whereas every other dinosaur book in the history of dinosaur book writing (laughs) is speculative to some extent. So there we are. I've said too much. (laughs) That, that, That was the justification behind the books. That's great. So then our last question for our listeners, where is the best place if they wanted to find out more about you and your work? Good heavens. Well, I have some websites which are relatively easy to find, but I guess the books as well. And um, uh, I I sound like a salesperson here, but (laughs) I've written down nearly everything I know in, in the Dinosaurs Rediscovered and Dinosaurs Visions of a Lost World. So I guess that's a good start. But we do have good websites for the University of Bristol, and we teach and we offer courses of various kinds, and there's a lot of detail about different research projects. So I won't attempt to give a web address, but it's relatively easy to find. Great. We'll make sure to put those in the show notes. Thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today. That was amazing. Yeah, that was great. (laughs) It's a great pleasure. Very happy to. Thank you. And thank you for the invitation. Jumping into the news. Just kidding. We're going into Hatseg Island. So Hatseg Island, this I should mention, this was a request to talk about the Hatseg Basin from Jurassic Site B. So thank you for requesting that and giving us the idea. Hatseg Island was a large island in the late Cretaceous located in the Tethys Sea between Laurasia and Gondwana. Basically what is now Europe. Yes. It's known for its basal dwarf dinosaurs, as well as one very large apex predator that wasn't a dinosaur, but could be just as terrifying. Garrett already mentioned what it was. (laughs) (laughs) Spoiler. Some of the dinosaurs from the island include Balaur, Bradinimi, Eloopteryx, and Antiornithines, Gargantuavis, Heptastiornis, 
Magyarosaurus, Paludotitan, Struthiosaurus transylvanicus. Couldn't say Sabrina's air quotes on the Struthiosaurus. Yes, we'll get to that. <laughs> Telmatosaurus and Zalmoxes. Of course, we can't talk about dwarf dinosaurs and Hatzeg Island without mentioning the Baron Franz Nopsche, a wealthy man with many interests who pioneered a lot of dinosaur analysis and theories and was one of the first people to look at more than just the bones of dinosaurs. Like he looked at the biology of dinosaurs. And Michael Benton mentioned him in the interview, of course, but we'll get a little bit more into Franz Nopsche's life story as well. There's... Two main sources I used for this episode, if you want to read more. We went into a lot of sources, but the two best ones were Traveler, Scholar, Political Adventurer, The Memoirs of Franz Nopsche. It's not really about his work on dinosaurs, but it's really interesting about his life, if you want to read more about his life. And then, of course, Dinosaurs and the Island Rule, The Dwarf Dinosaurs from Hatseg Island. That's that paper by Michael Benton and others that was published in 2010 that we talked a little bit about in our interview. So Hatseg Island was, again, a large island in the late Cretaceous. Today, that area is the Southern Carpathians, the mountains, and Western Romania, and it's landlocked. The island is well known for its dwarf dinosaurs. That's that theory that Franz Nopsche came up with. And the idea is that islands have limited resources so animals grew smaller over time. You know, insular dwarfism. Hatseg Island's been estimated to be about 31,000 square miles or 80,000 square kilometers. And it was probably about 120 miles or 200 kilometers away from other land. Now, there have been a lot of estimates about the size of this island, and that's partly because of sea levels changing. A deep marine basin surrounded the island, and it had a subtropical climate with an average temperature of 68 to 77 degrees Fahrenheit, or 20 to 25 degrees Celsius. There were rainy and dry seasons, but still a lot of tropical plants. The island also had rivers and lakes. Over 70 types of animals have been found from Hatseg Island, including fish, frogs, turtles, crocodilians, pterosaurs, birds, Lizards, snakes, mammals, and then, of course, dinosaurs. There's not as many types of dinosaurs as there were in other areas around the same time, but that's probably because they were on an island. In other parts of the world, in the late Cretaceous, like the Hell Creek Formation, the Lance Formation, the Horseshoe Canyon Formation, Nemet Formation, etc., there's often 30 to 40 dinosaur taxa. Now, in Europe, formations from around the same time had as few as 2 to 3 taxa and as many as 13. It's possible, however, that not as many fossils have been collected from these European formations, so there could still be more taxa. Yes, 70 animals is a lot. Yes. I think we're going to talk about something like 12 types of dinosaurs, so that is on the lower end in terms of dinosaurs. But just scratching the surface <laughs> because there's so many other animals there as well. Yeah. There's a number of formations in Hatseg Island, including the... Sompetru Formation, Densusa Chiula Formation, Sibesh Formation, Sard Formation, and Jibo Formation. Now, at the time of the Hatseg dinosaurs, most of what is now Europe was under the Chalk Seas, and what is now Eastern Europe was a chain of islands. And Hatseg there was probably one of those islands. In 2010, Michael Benton and Zoltan Siki analyzed the animals of Hatseg Island. And they mentioned the island rule, which was a term coined by Van Valen in 1973, where dwarfing or gigantism occurred on islands. And then, of course, Nopsha published on the dwarf dinosaurs of the Hatseg Basin in 1914 and said it was due to their, quote, restrictive habitat. The authors looked closely at the dwarf dinosaurs of the formation, since some of those dinosaurs' dwarf status had been questioned in 2005 by Leloeuf and then again in 2009 by Galton. And at recently published papers at the time of the area. Hatseg was also thought to have less diversity of dinosaurs than other areas, and there were several basal tetrapod lineages up to the end of the Cretaceous, which was unusual. Nopsha and others suggested that the dinosaur faunas of Hatseg were impoverished, and that this was evidence they lived on an island. And impoverished here refers to the low diversity of dinosaurs. But it turns out that that was partly because of the limited collecting of fossils. And now we do know about more dinosaur species than before. Now, compared to other areas of the world, the dinosaur fauna was impoverished, but 
it was similar to all European faunas from around the same time. So it does turn out there was more diversity in this ecosystem than previously thought. This area, it was mountainous and, quote, the from the 2010 paper, tectonic evolution of the surrounding mountainous areas appears to have had significant impact upon the paleo-environmental evolution of the basin itself, promoting a shift towards wetter, more moist environments during the later part of the Maastrichtian. They found that based on stable isotopes, the island had this tropical setting, uh, also known as a low-latitude paleogeographic setting. Not many plant fossils have been found, mostly spores and pollen and some leaf impressions, also some seeds and fruitifications. Hmm. <laughs> but they said the mesoflora, quote, suggests a semi-arid, seasonably variable climate. And there were also marshy ponds, floodplains, channels, and more. Marshes with fruitifications. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a hot island probably existed between the Cenomanian to the Maastrichtian in the late Cretaceous about 100 million years ago to 66 million years ago. There were streams, again, climate was subtropical, rainy and dry seasons, the tropical plants, probably lived off of monsoons. Hatzeg Island may have had also these, quote, occasional land bridges or shallow marine dispersal corridors to the European mainland or other emergent land masses of southern Europe. And when it became more shallow, that's when maybe other animals came to the island. Or new dinosaurs. Their type of animal, yes. <laughs> Most vertebrates from the island were found in the fine-grained floodplain deposits, not channels, and that is different from other formations found with dinosaur fossils. In the paper, they said, quote, skeletons show evidence of disturbance, breakage, and weathering, and bone beds, whether of larger or smaller elements, show remarkable mixing of materials from many sources, some relatively fresh and others much abraded or eroded. Now, smaller vertebrates like amphibians and lizards were found in ponds. Crocodiles, turtles, and mammals were found in less marshy areas, and that could show some habitat preferences, but the dinosaurs were found all over. Now, Hatzeg Island, it's not exactly the same as Hatzeg Basin, since each island was a little bit different. Hatzeg Island, quote, must have been significantly larger than the Hatzeg Basin itself. Also, quote, Hatzeg-type assemblages can be recognized all over the southwestern, western, and northwestern margin of the Transylvania Basin, thus significantly increasing the mappable area of this former land. So there's some differences in the animals you find in both, but there needs to be more study on this. The animals of Hatzeg Island were a mix of, quote, late surviving relict members of phylogenetic lineages that can be traced back to the early Cretaceous and endemic taxa that speciated on the island itself, end quote. So you've got a mix of these kind of older looking animals and then also the animals that evolved while on the island. So now we'll talk about the dwarf dinosaurs specifically. Benton et al. supported Nopes' dwarf island dinosaurs claim, that insular theory idea. Nopes suggested in around 1914, well, that's when it was officially suggested, that the dinosaurs lived on an island based on the low diversity of dinosaurs and the basal position of the specimens found. Most of these dinosaurs, they were from the end of the Cretaceous, but they looked like dinosaurs that came from the late Jurassic and early Cretaceous. The dinosaurs found were also smaller compared to their relatives from other areas. And Nopesha also wrote in 1914 that turtles and crocodilians and other animals still reached, quote, their normal size. So why mm, the dinosaurs? The ones that could swim. <laughs> Now, at least two of the dinosaurs that Benton and others found in 2010 were, quote, dwarfs by progenesis, a form of pedomorphosis. That includes the sauropod Magyarosaurus, which was only about 20 feet or 6 meters long, small for a sauropod, the ornithopod Telmatosaurus, and possibly the ornithopod Zalmoxis. They said, quote, as adults, the sauropod Magyarosaurus and the ornithopod Telmatosaurus seem to have been about one half the length of their close relatives from elsewhere. Now, others had proposed insular dwarfing based on Pleistocene mammals of the Mediterranean islands. This had been discussed by Forsyth Major in 1902, Bate in 1903, and also Bate in 1906. In 1964, 
Foster, quote, noted that small taxa generally became larger and large animals smaller. And then Van Valen named it the Island Rule in 1973. And sometimes this is also called Foster's Island Rule or Foster's Rule. Island Rule has been found in mammals, birds, and snakes, but not so much in lizards. Mary and others in 2004, 2006, and 2008 have said that there are too many exceptions to the term island rule, so we should stop using it. Hmm. When it comes to the terms dwarf and giant, Benton and all said that there was no formal understanding of when an animal was a dwarf or giant, but often it meant, quote, one half or one third or twice or three times the normal size. So you got to be at least double or a half. Yes. And then you count as a giant or a dwarf. Exactly. There's a few previous hypotheses for this island rule, which are no longer accepted, but they're fun to hear about, so we'll go over them. That includes the relict population idea, where giant rodents on islands are there from earlier populations, and then selection or the extinction of the mainland species led the island species to grow large. But there's not much evidence that smaller rodents displace the larger ones on the mainland, and there are more differences in the giant island rodents compared to the mainland rodents. Plus, there are size changes in other animals, mammals, birds, and lizards. Another hypothesis was the reduced prey size on islands, where smaller prey has fewer other animals to compete with, so there's a lot of small prey. Predators then might grow smaller to better go after the small prey. But there's not much evidence that island dwarf predator animals are matched by island dwarf prey animals, Plus, that doesn't help explain why herbivorous animals are growing smaller because their size doesn't match the size of the plants that they eat. Then there's the sexual selection on islands idea, where some of the pressures on the mainland don't exist on the island, so animals are free to grow larger, but there's not enough evidence for this. Next is the optimal body size idea, where there's less pressure and animals can grow to the size best for their environment and their energy needs, but the optimal body size for mammals there's just too many variables, and even related island species can be different sizes depending on the conditions of their islands. The last hypothesis that's no longer considered valid is the selection of immigrants for large size idea, where larger, stronger animals could swim to the islands from the mainland, but this is very hard to prove. Yeah, and those are sort of a mix of what makes things larger and smaller, too, it sounds like. Yes, now, there are other hypotheses that are still considered to be valid. That includes the ecological release one, where animals on islands don't have the same pressure from competitors, predators, and parasites on the mainland, their sphere of species, so their body size can change. Now, birds became flightless on islands to save energy, for example, and because there's less competition and predation. Larger animals may also become smaller because there aren't as many predators, so being large is no longer an advantage. Like if you're a sauropod. Yes. <laughs> the next is the niche expansion idea where animals can expand to new diets and opportunities because there are fewer species on the island. For example, smaller animals may grow larger on islands to, quote, take over the roles of absent middle-sized animals. The next is the resource limitation on islands idea, where animals grow smaller so they can live off the land's resources. They can't migrate far away for more food. And last is the optimization of life history traits idea, where some animals have traits, quote, metabolic rate, gestation time, size of birth, age and size at maturity, birth and death rates, trophic level, home range size, and population density, and these things make them better suited to island life. And then they can change their size based on their circumstances, you know, fill a niche or take advantage of either the presence or absence of certain competitors or competition. But it's really hard to find a predictable pattern for this. Sounds like in general, the earlier ideas were very short term sort of ideas like the big ones can make it to the island and you instantly have big ones there mm -hmm. or the small ones are better suited to the environment so the small ones stick around and then the later ideas are more about the ecology in general where it's like well on an island you have different pressures so over time they become these different sizes or they have these different features kind of like with when it comes to the science of dinosaurs 
we started off with this narrower look. We're just looking at the bones and now we look at what were their lifestyles like and how did they move and all, how did they grow? All, so it's just taking into account more factors. Mm -hmm. Animals on Hatsig Island span different periods of time. They're from different ages and therefore they're part of different fauna. So it's really difficult to talk about trends on the island like their sizes because they all lived at different times with different animals. Oh, just as a side note, there is another dinosaur that was found in what's now Germany, Europosaurus, that's also thought to have been an island dwarf. Now I'll move on to Franz Nopsha, who had, again, as you mentioned, a very interesting life. So the Baron Franz Nopsha lived from 1877 to 1933. He was well known for describing dinosaur dwarfism, but he was also a wartime spy and at one point, he even offered himself to be king of Albania, which uh, Michael Benton also mentioned. He really liked Albania. It was a whole thing. Yes. <laughs> Nanofsha was the oldest of three children, and he also spoke a ton of languages, Hungarian, Romanian, English, German, and French. Wow. Yes. He sometimes is called the father of modern paleontology, as he was the first person to study the biology of dinosaurs. According to Hans Dieter Seuss, Nopsha founded paleophysiology. He was studying clues in the fossil to figure out how extinct animals' bodies functioned internally. That includes like, how fast or big did they grow, sexual dimorphism, were they warm-blooded. He also thought that dinosaurs may have been social and parental, like modern birds. Nopsha was one of the first people in the 20th century to advocate that birds were descendants of dinosaurs. We have to say 20th century because... We talk about Huxley all the time, mm -hmm. <laughs> who said the same thing. Nopsha thought that birds came from small, ground-dwelling dinosaurs, though it turned out that wasn't the case. He also suggested the crests and horns of hadrosaurs were for sexual selection, like a peacock's tail. He compared pelvis and hind limbs of crocodiles to learn how running flight evolved in early birds, and he watched brooding birds and figured the hatchlings couldn't defend themselves, so Dinosaurs must have done some parental care, which was another new idea of the time. And he studied dinosaur tracks and how the big toe evolved to better understand the origin of birds. And he realized that animals, they had different ways of flying. <laughs> like how the big toe evolved? Yeah. Sounds very specific, but I assume it's important. <laughs> <laughs> Nopsha also analyzed slices of bone under a microscope to study cell structure so he's one of the first people to contribute to paleohistology, and he figured out which bones were most useful to analyze. And that's how he d determined that the sauropod Magyarosaurus wasn't a juvenile, but rather a dwarf dinosaur. Wow. So that was, Benton later sort of verified that. Yes. But I didn't realize Nopsha was actually working on that way back in the early 1900s. That's impressive. Yes, he had a lot of interesting ideas. Some of them you know, we found aren't correct. But, you know, at the time, just the fact that he was coming up with all these ideas when people were still mostly just looking at the bones, <laughs> it's pretty amazing. Yeah. And one of his ideas was that the overdevelopment of the hypophysis gland made dinosaurs too large and eventually led to their extinction. So that's one of those that you know, didn't quite pan out, but still cool. Nopsha worked very hard throughout his life. Sometimes, though, he was ill, and he had to stay in bed for a whole year once because of his illness. But he still published a lot of papers, including one where he adopted the theory of continental drift. And he didn't mention Alfred Wegener at the time, but he did send him a letter that said, quote, Meanwhile, I would, I would congratulate you for the confirmation of your drift hypothesis, and I'm glad to be one of the initial supporters of your hypothesis. In today's terms, we might say that Nopsha was bipolar. He called it shattered nerves. So he's very productive sometimes, and other times not as much. He published over 186 research papers on paleontology, geology, and Albanian studies. His geology studies of the Balkans led to a theory of plate tectonics, which was way ahead of its time by about 40 years, and his paleontology work was donated to the British Museum in London after his death. Despite all his accomplishments, though, his grave is unmarked. Really? Mm-hmm. There's hope to restore his castle and make it a center for scientific research and to create a large museum. Under communism, the books in his library were burned. That's a terrible loss. Yes. 
There's also not enough money to restore his castle for now, but there is a replica of Magyarosaurus outside of a current museum in the area that is anatomically correct. It was made by a Canadian artist. They did a Kickstarter campaign to cover the shipping costs. It's not clear why Nopsha was so unknown for so long. It could be his eccentricities, or it could be because he was gay. He was openly gay at a time when that wasn't really a thing. (laughs) Wow, I didn't realize he was openly gay. That's really interesting. Yeah, a lot of people knew that about him at the time, but it didn't really matter, possibly because he was an aristocrat. Mm, Yeah. It could also be he was considered an outsider scientist. He kind of thought he was above society. Also, Nopsha never visited the U.S. or Canada, even during there was a great dinosaur rush out to Alberta in the 1920s. But at that point, he was pretty poor and he had to sell his fossils. He also didn't really teach, so he didn't have many academic advocates. So it could be a lot of little things, Hmm. even though he was such a big figure in paleontology. So I'll talk about the dinosaurs that Nopsha described. He described multiple species of dinosaurs and reptiles. Before I get to the dinosaurs, one of the reptiles is a turtle, Kalakibotian biamidae, which means beautiful box of biamide, and it refers to his boyfriend's bottom because the shape of the shell reminded him of it. It was like a peach emoji. (laughs) A little bit. (laughs) Franz Nobsha's family owned estates in the area of Hatseg Island, and he noticed that close relatives of Hatseg dinosaurs in England, Germany, and North America were much bigger. He first noticed them in 1895 when his younger sister, Iona, found dinosaurs near their family estate at Sutzel in Transylvania when she was 12 years old. She was walking along a riverbank. At the time, all of this was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and now it is Western Romania. Nopsha sent the fossils that his sister had found to Professor Edward Seuss, and he asked him for advice about dinosaur osteology, and Seuss said, study them. (laughs) (laughs) That sounds like something a paleontologist would say to me, too. (laughs) Yeah. So he did, and then he attended the University of Vienna, and when he was 20 in 1897, he first reported on these fossils, and he continued to collect the fossils and write about them until World War I. Then the Romanian government seized the family estate in 1920. He stopped collecting, but he kept publishing on the fossils until he committed suicide. And we'll get to his death a little bit later. Nobsha, even though he did attend university, before that he was self-taught. He read books on geology, physiology, anatomy, neurology, and he even contacted scientists around Europe asking for more books. He excavated fossils. He prepared them with homemade glue. Based on jaw mechanics of lizards and alligators, he rearticulated the fossil jaw his sister first found, and he was one of the first people to compare dinosaurs to living animals. The first paper he wrote was when he named Tomatosaurus. That's that crushed skull that his sister found. And he published that when he was 22. In addition to describing the bones, he tried to reconstruct the soft tissues and muscle and brain. He did have a tendency to be arrogant, so he wasn't always easy to be around. He knew he was smart. He was also an aristocrat. That gave him a lot of privileges. There's an example of his arrogant behavior where he told Louis Doyle how great and important his work was considering his age. That's that's one of those backhanded compliments. Yes. (laughs) As you mentioned, in 1914, Nopsha wrote about insular dwarfism. He wrote, quote, While the turtles, crocodilians, and similar animals of the late Cretaceous reach their normal size, the dinosaurs almost always remain below their normal size. At one point, Nopsha became head of Hungary's geological survey, but he was a little too arrogant, and he was forced to resign in 1925. He owed a lot of money at that point, and he sold his fossils to the Natural History Museum in London. Then his health got worse, his debts piled up, and he became depressed. Apparently, after he quit, he went on a motorcycle journey across Europe with Bahami Doda. That's his secretary and his lover. From the end of World War I to the 1970s, no one studied the dinosaur fossils in the area. Then, starting in 1977, Grigoresu led summer camps every year for geology students to excavate fossils and study them. 
And these studies got more geologists and paleontologists interested in the fossils, and more people started studying Hatseg Island. Now, I've mentioned little bits of Nopsha's personal life. We'll get into a few more details of his life and his death. Nopsha was a great scholar, but he's kind of hot and cold as a person. He's been described as intelligent, curious, a keen observer, and diligent. His German language biographer, Gert Robel, wrote, quote, If we look back upon Nopsha's life, we can observe the many and extremely diverse aspects in his being, including many a contradiction. His ingenious intuition was in stark contrast to his inability to understand and appreciate the motives of others. His insensitivity and egoism were in contrast to his devotion to the Albanians, his critical intelligence to his emotional bias. A quote from the intro to his memoirs says, quote, Indeed, Nopsha may not always appear congenial or likable to the reader. He was constantly driven by a craving for recognition and prestige, was often irritable and arrogant, and on occasion openly anti-Semitic. Yeesh. Some of these traits may be understandable in view of his background and milieu, but many of his motives and reactions remain difficult to fathom, end quote. Yikes. That's not a glowing review of his behavior. True. Now, Nopsha's boyfriend was Bahamid Dada, and they met when Nopsha traveled in Romania. Nopsha was openly gay before that was socially acceptable, as we mentioned, but being an aristocrat, that did help. Although he was openly gay, when the two of them went to Vienna, he told everyone that Bahami was his live-in secretary for propriety. In 1933, when Nopsha was 55 years old, almost 56, he committed suicide. By then, he'd lost his land, his money, and his family home. It's thought that he, quote, drugged Dota with sleeping powder and shot him before committing suicide. In a note, it said, quote, I did not wish to leave him behind sick in misery and without a penny because he would have suffered too much. I wish to be cremated. So he was, Nopsha was 55, and his boyfriend was 45 at the time. Oof. I hope Dota knew what was coming. Uh, It seems like maybe not. Oof. Now, on April 26th of 1933, Nopsha sent his housekeeper on an errand, and then that's when he shot Dota and then himself. And in his suicide note, he said he had a nervous collapse. The two of them were laid to rest in Vienna at the same moment, at the same hour. There's an ash tree now over Dota's grave. Nopsha wrote, I wish to be burned in his note. And the room where Nopsha shot himself is now a real estate office. Oh, bad. Going back to that, you know, the unmarked grave. There's, there's just not a lot about him. Although at least we know where his castle is. Nopsha, of course, did a lot of other work, as we mentioned. He loved Albania. He started by studying the geology and geography of Albania, and then he moved on to customs, languages, and religions. Uh, he often dressed like Albanians when he was conducting his studies so as not to be recognized, and he published more than 50 journal articles about Albanian folk life. Albania was between Austria-Hungary and the Ottoman Empire, and Austria wanted an accurate geographical and cultural map. So Nopsha became a spy. That's when he hired Dota in 1906 to be, well, I guess his secretary. And he wrote in his journal that Dota was, quote, the only person who has truly loved me. In 1907, the two of them traveled the mountains in Albania, and they ended up being hostages of a well-known bandit, Mustafa Lita. They were dressed as Albanians, which Nopsha wrote in his memoirs was, quote, much better than in European dress, because people didn't stare as much and it was easier to talk to the locals. They made it to Mustafa Lita's home, which was full of weapons, and Nopsha wrote that he was a large man, Lita, who was not calm, but, quote, was not overly agitated, simply decisive. Nopsha offered to help him fulfill a wish of his, quote, without referring precisely to what I meant. Now, Lita had wanted to become an army major, but the inspector general of Macedonia had prevented it. Now, Lita then betrayed his guests, Nopsha and Dota, and made them his prisoners, saying he was demanding 10,000 Turkish pounds for their release. Nopsha managed to secretly send a letter asking the army major of Merdita for help in the form of either 500 armed men or opium 
and 20 men. <laughs> <laughs> and Hofsha also hid a razor under the carpet of his room as a backup in case a guard was going to be sent to sleep in their room and try to take their weapons away. His plan was to kill the guard, climb out of the tower with the sheets and carpets tied together. Wow, really going fantasy land escape there. He was ready. But with some help, Nopsha changed Lita's mind about the ransom and offered to get him his title as army major. And he convinced Lita to hand Nopsha over to the Turkish authorities as an Austro-Hungarian spy. I should also mention, uh, Michael Benton mentioned this, that Nopsha may also have been a spy for the British. This is during the war. Anyways. They made a very tiring trek over nearly a week. Just before they reached their destination, Nopsha got a note to the consulate, and everything worked out for Nopsha. Dota's father had heard about the whole ordeal and showed up with 10 armed men with 40 more nearby, and he wanted to shoot Lita, but Dota and Nopsha prevented him from doing so. And then at that point, everybody knew what was going on, and Lita went back home. Nopsha wrote, quote, of course I was unable to help him any further. <laughs> <laughs> was he still planning on helping him after he held him prisoner? It's unclear, but this just gives you an idea of his adventurous lifestyle. Yeah. <laughs> now, Nopsha did not like the Ottoman Turks that were ruling Albania. He wanted Albania to be an independent protectorate of the Austro-Hungarian <laughs> Empire. So he wanted <laughs> the empire he's from to be controlling <laughs> Albania. And he did also make it clear he'd accept the crown of Albania if his plan of guerrilla warfare against the Turks succeeded. Eventually, Albania did become independent in 1912, but Nopsha did not become king. Oh, shucks. He did offer at an international conference. The conference was about newly independent Albania. He offered to marry a wealthy American heiress who would want to be royalty in order to become the king, but that wasn't accepted. That's a weird way to rationalize it. I'll marry an American woman, and then we'll rule Albania together. <laughs> <laughs> You'd think you would marry an Albanian woman. He was looking for somebody with money. Oh, I see. Yeah. The German prince, Wilhelm von Wade, became the sovereign prince instead, although that didn't last long, and then World War I broke out. So still it was an outsider who became the king? Yes. I guess you were telling me the other day about how all these different nobility around Europe were all related. Yes. So it, it makes some sense, I suppose. During World War I, Nopsha joined the Imperial Austro-Hungarian Army as an officer, and then he led espionage missions in Romania. He was a commander of a company of Albanian volunteers in 1916. And then in 1918, Romania took over Transylvania and confiscated Nopsha's lands and money. And when he tried to visit one of his family's land later, he was nearly beaten to death by some rebellious peasants. So he went back to Vienna. And as a side note, just about his life, he also lived as a Romanian shepherd in the Carpathian Mountains for a time. Wow. Going on a, uh, what would we call that today? Like a retreat? <laughs> yeah, something <laughs> Without like technology that. and connections. To... He went to unplug. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Nopsha wrote memoirs, which is how I got a lot of these quotes and stories about his adventurous life. He started writing his memoirs before the end of World War I. His memoirs cover 1897 to 1917, when Nopsha turned 40. He lost his 1918 diary, which might be why it ends in 1917, and he completed writing his memoirs around 1929. Stadium Press in Budapest offered to publish the Hungarian translation, but Nopsha had so many last-minute changes, the publisher got tired and withdrew their offer, and then negotiations for the German-language version broke down, so his memoirs ended up not being published for 70 years. Wow. Yes. Again, going to that, he's not the easiest to work with <laughs> idea. <laughs> and that he's relatively unknown, because if, if people were really interested in him, I'm sure they would have pushed a little faster than 70 years. Yes. Before Nopsha killed himself, he wrote a letter to his colleague, Professor Norbert Jockel, with a list of manuscripts about Albania that he was leaving behind and a request to get those published. But for financial reasons, they weren't published. And also the professor was murdered by Nazis in early 1942. In his memoirs, 
Nopsha's memoirs, he doesn't get too personal, at least around his love life. Uh, for example, he writes, quote, My private life in London carried on calmly and uneventfully, with Bahamid taking care of my daily needs, such as strawberry jam, etc. What? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> strawberry jam, etc. <laughs> yes, that's how he talks about his boyfriend. <laughs> <laughs> he also refers to... To his bachelor apartment in his memoirs. I guess he's not married, so maybe that technically makes him a bachelor. Yeah, could be. Just some highlights from his memoirs. In 1903, while traveling through Albania, one day at dawn, he was shot at. He wrote, quote, the bullet went right through my hat and grazed my head, but did not injure me. Oof. Yes, so he leapt off his horse and he tried to fire back, but he couldn't see who did it. <laughs> so just firing randomly. Yeah. <laughs> and hopes that he would hit the person who tried to hit him. In the part between the annexation and the Balkan War, 1910 to 1912, Nopsha went to Berlin to lecture at the German Geological Society of Berlin and saw the dinosaur remains from German East Africa. And one geologist asked him if he was related to the dinosaur specialist, the Baron Nopsha. <laughs> <laughs> so shows how well known he was. <laughs> I wonder if he was looking at Spinosaurus. He didn't mention which dinosaur. He just said ah. dinosaur remains. There was not much about dinosaurs in his memoirs. Spinosaurus, I don't think, was in Germany by 1912. Yeah, you're right, because yeah. they had to wait till after World War I to finally get them out. Yes. Now, later, Nopsha became an external member of the Geographical Society in London and an honorary member of the London Zoological Society, the Academy of Bologna, the Geographical Society in Vienna, and the Geological Institute in Vienna. He was also an honorary member of the Hungarian Geological Society and a full member of the Hungarian Academy of Science. So it seems like he was fairly well respected. In 1929, at an exhibit at the British Museum, he published on skeletal remains, and he wrote, quote, This piece was especially interesting because it was the first more or less complete skull of an Ancathopholus dinosaur. What's an Ancathopholus? It's a small armored dinosaur. Clubless. Hmm. Sounds like a Thyreophorian. I'm a fan. Yeah, notosaurid. Oh, it's only a notosaurid. Not, yeah. not an ankylosaurid. Yes. Those, <laughs> those three items were all I could find related to dinosaurs in his memoirs. Wow. It's mostly about his adventures. Fortunately, other people wrote about it, and he wrote about it in publications, yes, right? So you can yeah. get it elsewhere. Exactly. All right, we have covered Nopsha, we have covered Hatseg Island in general. Now let's get to the heart of this, which is, of course, the animals. Hatseg Island dinosaurs, as we mentioned, they tended to be more basal. That includes Magyarosaurus, Telmatosaurus, Salmoxes, Struthiosaurus. The ornithopods of Europe from the late Cretaceous seem to be relictual. They're survivors of a once diverse group. This may mean that these types of dinosaurs used to be more common, and then when the land got split up into islands, their range was split, or they island hopped from the mainland. It's unclear what exactly happened. As we mentioned, Magyarosaurus, Zelmoxes, and Telmatosaurus are considered to be dwarfs. The ankylosaur, Struthiosaurus, as well as an unnamed pterosaur, were smaller than expected that were found on the island, but it's unclear if those specimens are adults or subadults. So there was a small pterosaur on the island. Yes, yeah. but it's unnamed. The Hatseg dromaeosaurids and troodontids are small, but they're also about the same size as their relatives in Asia and North America. But the crocodilians, turtles, and mammals are all about the same size as their relatives from other parts of the world. And then we've got that giant pterosaur, Hatsagopteryx, which was large with a wingspan of about 39 feet or 12 meters. Now, the main formations of Hatseg Island include the Sompetru Formation from the early Maastrichtian, the Densash Chiula Formation, which is from the late Cretaceous. There's a lot of material that came from volcanoes there, not as many fossils. And the Sebish Formation, also from the Maastrichtian. So mostly around 70 million years ago, maybe 80. <laughs> yeah, at least the, the main formations there, yeah. Getting into the dinosaurs, we'll start with Balaur which was our Dinosaur of the Day in episode 297, so if you want more details, you can head over to that episode. 
I'll just quickly say that the type species is Balaura bondoc, and the full name means stocky dragon. It was a theropod estimated to be around 6 to 7 feet or 1.8 to 2.1 meters long, and it's closely related to Velociraptor. Yes, it's about the same size as Velociraptor, too. Yeah. Now, the holotype is an articulated partial skeleton. The carpals and metacarpals were fused, so it only had two functional fingers, and that's different from other dromaeosaurids that had three. It also had two claws on each foot and features in the legs that made it likely to have been able to have powerful kicks. Oh, that's right. I remember that one now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the double clawed feet was really interesting. Yes. And it was secondarily flightless. Next is Elopteryx. The type species is Elopteryx nopshi. Hey, I wasn't (laughs) aware of anything that got named after him. Yeah, there we go. Now, there's a lot of debate over the phylogeny of Elopteryx. Most recently, it's considered to be an alvarosaurid, but it's also considered to be a nomum dubium. Mm. Nopsha found these fossils. There were small fragments that were later acquired by the British Museum of Natural History. And then it was named by Charles William Andrews in 1913. The holotype is a left femur. And then later, a second upper left thigh bone fragment was found and referred to Elopteryx, as well as a distal left tibiotarsus. So only pieces of the top and bottom of the leg. Yes, that's why it's dubious. Yeah, it's not great. Andrews originally thought that it was a seabird. The genus name Elopteryx means marsh wing, and the species name, of course, is in honor of Nopsha. And there's been a lot of lumping and splitting of the fossils for Elopteryx, Bradinemi, and Heptastiornis. So the next one we'll talk about then is Bradinemi. The type species is Bradinemi draculae. <laughs> <laughs> I think I remember that one because it's from Transylvania. Yes. It's a theropod. It's known from a partial right lower leg. It's been most recently classified as an alvarosaurid, but originally it was thought to be a giant owl. Now, if it were an owl, it would have been stout and it would have been about six and a half feet or two meters tall. This thing should be a lot of indications that maybe dinosaurs and birds are related when every time they find a dinosaur bone, at first they're thinking, this looks like a bird bone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a giant bird. <laughs> yeah. Braddy Nemi was named in 1975 by Colin James, Oliver Harrison, and Cyril Alexander Walker. Originally, it was assigned to Elopteryx. This holotype, it's a wide distal tibiotarsus. It's in the leg that's about 38 millimeters wide. So a little over an inch, inch and a half, maybe. The genus name, Braddy Nemi, means ponderous leg. And the species name means the dragon in Romania and refers to Dracula. I didn't realize Dracula meant dragon. Yeah, me either. A little bonus fun fact in there. (laughs) Then there's Heptastiornis. The type species is Heptastiornis andrusi. It's a dubious alvarosaurid, also described in 1975 by Harrison and Walker, and they thought it was a giant prehistoric owl. A lot of owls. It had been included as part of the holotype of Elopteryx, but that turned out to be an error. Nopsha also found these fossils, but it's considered to be a nomum dubium because, again, only fragments have been found. That includes two broken distal tibiotarsi, a large bone in the leg. The genus name, Heptastiornis, means seven cities or seven castles, and that's the common name for the region in Transylvania where it was found. The species name is in honor of C.W. Andrews, who named Elopteryx. Next are the enantiornis that were found. That includes a nearly complete right humerus and end of a left humerus that was found, as well as evidence of colonial nesting that shows that they buried their eggs. But there's not too much else to say. Then there's gargantuavis. The type species is gargantuavis philoinos. It was a large basal bird. It's actually one of the largest known birds from the Mesozoic, and it's estimated to weigh about 310 pounds or 140 kilograms. Holy cow. That is very big. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) I wonder, that's heavier than some birds I've heard claim to be the heaviest birds ever. So (laughs) that that estimate must vary depending on who's looking at it. And which specimen you're looking at, because fossils have been found in northern Spain, southern France, and Romania. 
The first fossils were found in France in 1995, and then it was described in 1998 by Bouffetat and Lelouf. Only fragments are known. No skull has been found, but then a pelvis was found in 2019 from Hatseg Island, and it had a broad pelvis, which shows it wasn't a fast runner. Also, based on the femur, they're saying it wasn't adapted to running. However, Gargantuavis grew quickly, that's based on bone histology, and then it slowed down its growth for about 10 years, and then it became skeletally mature. And this pattern is similar to kiwi birds. Oh, okay. Yeah, now that you mentioned it might be a flightless bird, mm. the things I've read about other birds being the largest <laughs> ever might still apply because they're talking about flying birds. Mm. Oh, yes. The genus name Gargantuavis refers to Gargantua, the giant and main character in the 16th century French novel, The Life of Gargantua and of Pantagruel. The species name, Philonos, means one who likes wine. <laughs> and that's because the fossils were first found around vineyards and wineries. That's funny. A giant that likes wine. <laughs> who doesn't, I guess. <laughs> Then there's the dinosaur Magyarosaurus, which was our dinosaur of the day in episode 262, so you can get even more details if you head over there. And there's two species. There's Magyarosaurus dacus and Magyarosaurus hungaricus, which the hungaricus one is bigger, but it hasn't been fully studied yet. The fossils are more of a rare find. It's possible that Magyarosaurus hungaricus was from a time when sea levels were lower and they could immigrate and then have enough resources because the sea levels were lower that made the island larger, or maybe they're stray animals from nearby larger land areas. Hmm. Magyarosaurus, however, was a dwarf sauropod with dermal armor. Nice. Yeah, it was about 16 to 20 feet or 5 to 6 meters long, which is small for a sauropod. Oh yeah, that's tiny. <laughs> Especially for a, a Cretaceous sauropod. Yes. And it's possible that it was small by pedomorphoses, which means it kept its ancestral juvenile characteristics. It weighed about 1.1 tons, which also is much smaller than other sauropods and much smaller than other titanosaurs because Magyarosaurus is a, also a titanosaur. The bone histology of Magyarosaurus found that this... These specimens were fully mature and therefore smaller than other sauropods. There's an, quote, extremely reduced growth rate. Enough individuals have been found to represent a growth series. And Magyarosaurus is closely related to Repetosaurus, Nemectosaurus, Malawisaurus, and Trigonosaurus, but obviously is much smaller. The genus name Magyarosaurus means Magyar lizard. And Magyar refers to a group of people who are native to Hungary. Next there's, in quotes, Megalosaurus hungaricus. Megalosaurus was our dinosaur of the day in episode 47, and we do talk a lot about that dinosaur in general if you want to head over there. But as for Megalosaurus hungaricus, in 1902, Nopsha named Megalosaurus hungaricus based on two teeth found in Transylvania. No, oh, jeez. Those teeth have <laughs> since been lost. Oh, double O, jeez. That's why it's in quotes. So now it's an indeterminate theropod. Yeah, and at that time, Megalosaurus was a pretty big wastebasket taxon anyway. Mm -hmm. So it already probably wasn't really a Megalosaurus. Plus, it's just so hard to know a dinosaur based on teeth. Yeah. Next is Palatitan. The type species is Palatitan naladzensis. It was a titanosaur, estimated to be about 20 feet or 6 meters long. The shoulder height is 6 foot 7 inches or about 2 meters. This dinosaur was found in 2002 on a Belgian-Romanian expedition. They found a partial skeleton with no skull. That included vertebrae, chevrons, the right half of the pelvis, left ischium, lower end of the right thigh bone, and two toe claws. All these bones probably came from one individual because they were found close together. Gregory Paul thought that this specimen could be the same as Magyarosaurus dacus. The fossils do look a lot like Magyarosaurus fossils, and there are some overlapping fossils, but they were found in different locations, and they don't share any unique traits or synapomorphies. Palodotitan had short, erect neural spines along its tail. It was described in 2010 by Zoltan Siski and others, and at the time, it was the most complete sauropod found in Romania. The genus name means marsh titan, palatitan, 
and the species name, Nalazensis, refers to where it was found. Next is another dinosaur in quotes, Struthiosaurus transylvanicus. Mm -hmm. It actually doesn't have a proper name, and that's why it has the quotes around it. Struthiosaurus austriacus was named in 1871 by Bunzel for a small isolated fragment that was found in Austria, and it was thought to be an ankylosaur. Nopsha compared the Hatzeg fossils with Struthiosaurus austriacus and other European ankylosaurs, and then he referred material to Bunzel's Struthiosaurus as Struthiosaurus transylvanicus. Coombs and Marianska, however, consider Struthiosaurus austriacus to be a nomum dubium. Hmm, I see. So the genus name Struthiosaurus means ostrich lizard, and uh, that's because it was thought to have this bird-like head. Hmm. Not to be confused with Struthiomimus, which is the bird mimic. Yes. And looks a lot more like a bird than a notosaur. <laughs> <laughs> Our next dinosaur is Tilmatosaurus. That was a dinosaur of the day in episode 277, so you can go back to that if you want to hear even more details. But quickly, the type species is Tilmatosaurus transylvanicus. It's the first dinosaur that Nopska named. It's a basal hadrosaur, had narrow dentary teeth, and it was about 16 feet or 5 meters long and weighed about 1,100 pounds or 500 kilograms. The holotype was crushed, but did have a long skull, the largest dentary found has about 30 tooth positions. It had dental batteries, as well as narrow diamond-shaped teeth, and a long arched blade-like neural spine. The femur is also slightly bowed. Compared to Myasaur, another hadrosaur, the smallest Telmatosaur specimens were smaller than young nesting Myasaur, and the adult Tomatosaurus specimens were slightly more robust than Myasaur individuals that were roughly the same size, though those Myasaur individuals that were about the same size as the adult Tomatosaurus were probably young subadult Myasaur. Mm -hmm. Tomatosaurus is smaller than more basal iguanodonts like Oranosaurus and Iguanodon bernisartensis, and it had teeth with features like juvenile Oranosaurus and Iguanodon. These maxillary teeth, again, were narrow and diamond-shaped, and the dentary teeth were wider and asymmetrical and small. All of this helps support the idea of dwarfing by pedomorphosis, where sometimes you keep juvenile traits even as an adult. It's also possibly via progenesis, which is the retention of ancestral juvenile characteristics by earlier maturation in the descendant. So you keep your juvenile characters even though you mature a little earlier. As an example, with Telmatosaurus, it may have finished developing its teeth earlier than its larger close relatives. Telmatosaurus has been found with a non-cancerous tumor in the jaw. It was benign. The tumor was in the early stages of development, so probably wasn't too painful for that particular dinosaur. And before Telmatosaurus, this type of tumor, ameloblastoma, had been found in humans, mammals, and some modern reptiles but not dinosaurs. Because Telmatosaurus is a basal hadrosaur, it may mean that hadrosaurs were more prone to tumors than other dinosaurs. Now, this particular Telmatosaur specimen died before it was an adult. Only two lower jaws are known, so it's unclear how it died. It's possible that the tumor indirectly caused its death. Maybe it made it appear weaker to a predator or something like that. And that's based on the idea of modern predators often going for weaker or more vulnerable prey. So poor Telmatosaurus. The genus name Telmatosaurus means marsh lizard. And again, we get into even more details on that dinosaur in episode 277. The last dinosaur I'll mention is Zelmoxes. The type species is Zelmoxes robustus. It's known as Zelmoxes now, but at first it was thought to be Maclodon robustum. It was described in 1899 by Franz Nopsche. Nopsche referred to Maclodon, an ornithopod named by Seeley that was found in Austria. He referred to part of the material as Maclodon susai and part of it as Maclodon robustum. Then later in 1915, he said that Maclodon may be the same as Rhabdodon and that the differences were due to sexual dimorphism. Nopsha compared the fossils with other ornithopods from Europe and North America, like Camptosaurus, and found it to be similar to Rhabdodon that was found in France. 
In 1990, George Olszewski corrected the name to Rabdodon Robustus instead of Robustum. And then Zalmoxis Robustus was named by Weishampel and others in 2003 because they found enough differences to make it its own dinosaur. Split it out from Rabdodon. Yes. Another species was also named in 2003, Zalmoxis Shiporum. Uh, the species name Shiporum is for the Albanian name for Albanians. Both of these species were found in the Hatseg Basin. In 2009, an analysis of the specimens found differences between the two species were not due to growing or sexual dimorphism. They were also found together in several localities. Zalmoxis is a bipedal herbivore. It had a large triangular head and a beak. Subadults have been found on Hatseg Island that range from 6.6 to 7.9 feet or 2 to 2.4 meters long. Salmoxis shiparum is a larger one. A subadult has been found that's 8.2 feet or 2.5 meters long. There's also an unnamed species with an adult, and that one's 9.5 feet or 2.9 meters long. It's a monster. Yes. Almost 10 feet long. <laughs> <laughs> so... Zelmoxis robustus may have been a bit of a dwarf dinosaur, but the other species don't really seem to be. So they're similar to some of the relatives elsewhere, I guess. Yeah. Ornithopods do get a lot bigger than that, but not all of them. <laughs> well, over time, Zelmoxis got more teeth. It went from eight to ten tooth positions in the jaw. The delto pectoral crest also got longer. The tibia would get more robust. And the hind limb proportions would change. It would go from having a relatively short femur to having a femur about as long or longer than the tibia. Hmm. That's not good for sprinting. No. <laughs> Zalmoxis is part of the family Rhabdodon today, along with Maclodon and Rhabdodon. The genus name refers to the Dacian deity Zalmoxis, who retreated in a crypt for three years to be resurrected on the fourth year. And they're saying that's similar to how these fossils were liberated. Zelmoxis was also a slave of Pythagoras, who traveled to Dacia and became a deity. Then the species name, Robustus, refers to its robust build. And I did say that was the last dinosaur, but that's because this next one's a little less specific. It's about dinosaur egg nests that have also been found in Hatseg. There were 14 eggs found in 1989, and these eggs were in four linear clutches, which each clutch had two or four eggs. The eggs were subspherical, and the egg shell is about 2.4 millimeters thick, and it had this tuber collated pattern. So the size, shape, and texture of those eggs are similar to those found in eggs found in southern France. And embryonic material of a hadrosaur has been associated with those eggs, possibly of Tilmatosaurus. All right, that's it for the dinosaurs of Hatseg Island. But as we mentioned, there were some other amazing animals that have been found from this area. One in particular. Yes, the pterosaur. So, of course, we have to talk about Hatsegopteryx. The type species is Hatsegopteryx thambema. It was a giant as dark a pterosaur and one of the biggest found. It was named in 2002 by Eric Buffetta and others based on parts of the skull and humerus and it was stocky and powerful. It's known from partial limb bones, the neck bone, and parts of the skull. It had a really large neck vertebra, which means that it had a proportionally short, stocky neck. It wouldn't have twisted its neck. It was probably the apex predator of the island. Its head was around six and a half to 10 feet, or two to three meters long. What? Yeah. That's ludicrous. And the neck was around 5 to 10 feet or 1.5 to 3 meters long. And its estimated wingspan was 33 to 39 feet or 10 to 12 meters. It could probably fly. So very large, very scary. The holotype includes two fragments from the back of the skull and a damaged part of the left humerus. Originally, this animal was thought to be a theropod back in 1991. Yeah, when you find something that big, <laughs> yeah. you might not think this is a flying creature. <laughs> Hatsagopteryx had a wide skull with large muscular attachments. It had bones in the skull that were spongy instead of hollow. 
So it had these stout, robust skull bones. Some sources say the skull was estimated to be about five feet or 1.6 meters long. That sounds a lot more reasonable than six and a half to 10 feet. Still giant. Yeah, (laughs) still crazy. (laughs) The bones in the skull were full of small pits and hollows, and that would make the skull way less. And you see this with wing bones as well. The skull was sturdy and stress resistant and also lightweight. As you mentioned, the neck vertebra, it was short and robust. It was about 12 inches or 30 centimeters long. And pterosaurs in general have nine neck vertebrae. This neck on Hatsagopteryx probably had a lot of muscles. Hatsagopteryx had some similarities with Quetzalcoatlus. It also had wing bones like other flying pterosaurs, so that means it could fly. It was probably a generalist predator. It may have gone for prey that was too large to swallow whole. We see some modern storks do this with their beaks, also with flamingos. The genus name Hatsagopteryx means Hatsag basin wing, and the species name Thambema means terror monster. I had no idea that storks ate flamingos. That's crazy. Yes. Birds are crazy. They are dinosaurs indeed. (laughs) (laughs) Now, pterosaurs in general had wings formed by membranes that stretched between their elongated finger to their legs. They also had many teeth, and they started off small, although obviously some of them grew quite large. (laughs) Many pterosaurs lived around water, and many of them ate fish. Others ate fruit or were filter feeders or they crushed their food as predators. And like the dinosaurs, pterosaurs also went extinct around the KPG extinction event. Now, Hatseg Opteryx, it was the largest pterosaur found so far on, on Hatseg Island, but it's not the only one. Other as darkids pterosaurs include Eurus Darko and Alba Draco as well as an unnamed one that's based on a neck vertebra that was medium-sized and robust. And then, of course, there were other animals that lived on the island, and that included mammals that are mostly rodent-like ones, as well as insectivores, crocodiliforms, amphibians, including frogs, turtles, fish, and squamates. There was a lot going on in this island. That is a lot. And just to wrap things up nicely, Hatseg Island, it was strange and diverse. There was a lot of interesting experimentation going on, and obviously a lot of different types of animals. The dinosaurs, they were mostly basal, and they were smaller than their relatives. And the largest predator, the apex predator, was a pterosaur that could walk, run, and fly well. (laughs) And that just helps show how weird and cool prehistoric animals were. Yeah, a really amazing island with all sorts of interesting stuff going on. Mm -hmm. And now on to our fun fact. I'll keep it relatively short. It has to do with a dwarf animal, but not a dwarf dinosaur. The straight-tusked elephant, Paleoloxodon, started in Africa and then migrated to Europe sometime between 0.8 and 0.6 million years ago. And one species, Paleoloxodon antiquus, lived on islands in the Mediterranean, and over time became a dwarf elephant. And their skulls may have led to the myth of Cyclops, because the hole in the middle where the nasal area used to be was thought to be a large single eye socket. Yeah, yeah, since it's teeth and they don't always fossilize or sometimes they're not in the skull when you find it, it does leave that big weird center hole in the front of the head. Although it is pretty low for an eyeball, but I guess if you're not orienting it right, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you might think that it was high on the head. It's interesting. Just makes me think of the Odyssey. Nobody did this to me. (laughs) And that wraps up our milestone 400th episode. We hope you enjoyed learning all about the Hotseg Island and Nopsha and a bunch of the animals. (laughs) Thank you again to everyone for sticking with us these past 400 episodes. We look forward to the next 400. Thanks for listening and until next time.